Yes, ma'am. It is October 12th, 2020, and you are listening to episode 16 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. I hope everyone enjoyed and learned something from last week's episode with Steve Hanisovsky, clarinetist with the Phoenix Symphony. If you're looking for tips on how to network with other clarinetists and musicians, make sure to check it out. We have quite an exciting lineup of guests coming up for the next three weeks. Next week, on the on the 19th of October, we will be having Kevin Case, who is the Ixam General Counsel and represents many different orchestras in their collective bargaining sessions. So if you're interested in learning more about negotiations and the legal side of the business, definitely check that out. The following week on the 26th, Steve Williamson, principal clarinet of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, will be joining me to talk about being a principal player in an orchestra and the different things that he does sonically in order to be convincing with his musical ideas. Definitely will not want to miss out on that one. Steve is obviously one of the great principal clarinetists in the world, and I'm sure he will have lots of great advice packed into that episode. Finally, on November 2nd, Dr. Andy Hudson, assistant professor of clarinet at UNC Greensboro, will be joining me to talk about maintaining positive relationships and just being a good person uh, in addition to being a good musician. So as you can tell, we have quite an amazing lineup of guests coming up. And of course, the easiest way to gain access to new episodes is to subscribe to the podcast. So if you haven't done so yet, I would encourage you to take a second right now to hit that subscribe button on whatever your podcasting platform of choice is. On today's episode of the podcast, Katie McGinnis, Vice President of Artistic Planning at the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, is joining me to talk about what it is like to plan an orchestra season. I've been really looking forward to having Katie on, as she always has a lot of great things to say and is definitely candid in terms of what she does with her job and career. As you can imagine, it is quite a massive undertaking to plan an orchestra season, and I thought it would be both interesting and educational to explore all the decisions and work that goes into the process of such a large-scale endeavor. Katie, it's so nice to see you. It's really nice to see you as well, Sam. Thanks so much for having me, and hello to everyone out there watching. Yeah, uh, I am super excited for this, and I, you're you're just a great person, and uh, you've been such an asset to the ISO ever since you've been here, and uh, I think, you know, just to give people with perspective uh, from start to finish about how long does it take to plan a full orchestra season? Yeah, it takes um, quite a long time. So I look after um, all of the classical programming for the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. And really I start, um, I start first with our subscription series, which is about it's, it varies between 18 to 20 weeks, depending on what relationships and partnerships we have with either, either IVCI or APA that season or whatnot. But it's roughly 18 to 20 subscription weeks per season. And I typically start a little over a year and a half in advance of the season. So to give you a sense, right now it's October 12th, and I have started to map out who's going to come for the 22-23 season. But we actually got together, it's, you know, we get all departments together. We get the development department, the operations department, the marketing, the education, my department, the POPs artistic department, and we map out the weeks. And we've already had those in place now for a few months. You know, we really do that sort of around May, June, July, something. And that then gets the ball rolling, as I say, about a year and a half in advance. So I'm working on putting things in place for the 22-23 season now in October 2020, but we won't launch that season until February 22. Oh my gosh. So, so that gives you a sense. Yeah. So you, so I, I guess for me to collect all this information, you actually have to deal with sort of three seasons at a time, right? Because it's, yes. it's the one you're currently in. Mm -hmm. And then the following season, which you're kind of finalizing, and yep. then you're the beginning stages of mapping out two seasons yep. from now. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if we were in normal circumstances right now, which I 
truly wish we were, but COVID has impacted the entire world. And if we were in normal circumstances right now, I'd be dealing with the artists that I would have booked and programmed for the 2021 season. So that's the logistics, the on the ground stuff. And I have a team that helps me with that. But then I'm also right now putting the finishing touches to the 21-22 season because marketing start to ramp up at this stage. I start to give them the programs, who the conductor, who the artist is going to be typically around August. And then they start putting it together in a design for the brochure. And soon enough, I'll start seeing drafts of that brochure probably around December. And then the month of December and January is absolutely insane leading up to the launch, which happens in February. And we proof like crazy for that brochure for the 21-22 season. But even while I'm doing that, I'm starting the 22-23 season. And and often that that's, that's it, it is, you know, you're always in these different modes the whole time. But um, that's a good time to start it because very often there's certain things that you wish could have made it in to the season that you're about to launch. So then you're like, oh, okay, brilliant. Then I won't forget it. It's going into 22, 23. So there's a couple of conductors and artists that didn't make it into 21, 22, but I've already started to sketch them out for 22, 23. So it's a good way not to forget, you know, because you get a lot of stuff thrown at you all the time and you do forget things. So Yeah, I, yeah. I had a thought that you must have either the uh, world's biggest planner and calendar or the world's biggest hard drive to keep track of all this different stuff yeah yeah it's um hard drive yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard drive and and it's a number of different documents like you know i've got the full season all the weeks who's going in there i have availability charts you know i don't want to jump ahead of maybe questions but looking at availability, trying to get the jigsaw puzzle together, keeping the list of conductors that I want to see, the list of artists I want to see, the list of works I want to have the orchestra do, and then just constantly kind of meshing it all together into a big jigsaw puzzle to get it ready for a launch February every year. Wow, that's amazing. That's a there's certainly it's a fun. lot of uh, things to juggle at once. Um, it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I had the privilege of serving on the artistic advisory committee with you uh, for a year, and uh, it's it's actually really. I just gave it a little insight. It's it's really fantastic. She has these big sheets of paper and, and they're, they're these big charts where it's like, uh, I guess we can get into this now. Where uh, mm. you know it's like a all the eighteen to twenty weeks are all mapped out. So you have on the left column you have all the conductors and soloists, and then. In the right or the middle column, there's like all the dates, the potential dates, and then the far right column, it's uh, the pieces of music that you're either considering or are finalized or whatever. So, can you sort of describe like how that chart kind of gets filled in? Yeah. So, as I said, once we once we establish which are the classical weeks. And that's done as one big group with all departments sitting in the room, so that we make sure that the music director weeks are accounted for, our principal pops conductor weeks are accounted for, that we're spreading out the pops and classical weeks evenly so that marketing feel like there's, you know, you don't want to put five classical weeks in a row, for example. Uh, so we map it out that way. And then our head of um, venue operations, David, he lets us know of things that are going on in downtown Indy to avoid, you know, Indy 500, that, that sort of stuff. So once I get those weeks, then they don't see me for another couple of months in relation to that specific season. And I go back to my list of conductors that I'm interested in. And I try to get a variety of conductors. So the things that I and, and have been doing since I started with the ISO back in January 2017, what I noticed when I started then was the orchestra had amazing conductors, but not a lot of seasoned conductors mm -hmm. you know there wasn't a lot of conductors that have been on the scene for a long time that have lots of experience and what I noticed is is that the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra is actually quite a young orchestra you know Christoph has hired approximately 20 some new musicians in his 10 years with us and seven of those I believe have been principal players my numbers might be slightly off but it gives you a sense yeah it's pretty close it's, yeah. yeah. And so with all of these new principal players and a lot of the principal players, it's their first full-time professional job as well. 
So what I noticed was, okay, we, I, I mentioned this in a meeting, a music director search meeting earlier, we actually have a Ferrari at the ISO. I mean, it is a well-oiled, beautiful Ferrari. And what I noticed when I started was I want to be able to have Michael Schumacher drive it. I want to have somebody who's really experienced, who knows what they're doing. So I try to get elder statesmen, seasoned conductors, experienced conductors. Then I try to get a couple of debuts in there as well, be it young or old. Debut doesn't necessarily mean young always. It can just be somebody that's been on the scene for a long time, but the ISO has never seen them. Or it can be the new up and comer, like, you know, now the, the, the new hot shot is Klaus Michaela, for example, and everybody's scrambling to try to get a week with him. And I'm ashamed, but I'm in that mix too. You know, we, we all <laughs> sure. kind of fight for it. And then you have your rec returning guest conductors, people that you want to be building a relationship with. Because I was given advice by um, Greg Gleisner, who's a consultant now for a lot of orchestras. He's been in the industry for a long time. He is very prestigious, really knows the business very well. And he gave me advice uh, several years ago now. And I, it's always stuck with me. And I've said it numerous times on chats like this, but you're always in a music director search. Mm -hmm. So even in our current music director search, my head's in the next music director search as well. There are some names that we have on the list that aren't quite right for what we're looking for right now, but they might be in 10 years time. And so I try to build a relationship by having the returning conductors each season so we get to know them. Sam, you and I have chatted about this before. You know, you might have a guest conductor come in and love that person. And then they come the next season and the orchestra hates them because it's a different program. It's so much is so much is based on what the program is and also what preceded their week. If the orchestra had a bad week, then that conductor as a debut has a better chance and whatnot. So mm -hmm. complicated way of explaining it. But basically, that's how I decide the conductors. That's also how I decide the artists. And then you get to the program point. Yeah. So can I can I that, stop you really quick for this? Please. I just had a quick yeah. follow up on the uh, conductors. So how yeah. much of this, in terms of the conductors and the soloists, uh, how much of that is in consultation with the music director? Like, does Christoph have a say in half of it, or obviously he does his own weeks, or mm -hmm. he or she, mm -hmm. whoever is in mm -hmm. place, um, mm -hmm. they have their own set weeks, and they have pretty much the deciding voice in those weeks but for the other weeks like how much do you sort of bounce things off them and hey do you know this person what do you think about this person like how much mm -hmm. does that go into it it's that's yeah it's a great question and it depends on the music director in Tristoff's case he definitely wants to know who the guest conductors are because he feels a sense of responsibility actually you know that he feels okay yeah, i mean of course he trusts me but in the same breath he is the music director and he knows the orchestra better than I do. He just does. He's the music director. And he feels a sense of responsibility. So he likes to know who, but he does rely on my expertise and my knowledge of who's out there. Whereas my previous music director, I was the number two for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. And I was a part of those conversations. And that was with Manfred Honick. And he's very involved in the process. He also feels a sense of responsibility, but he's very involved in who is it, when are they coming, what are they doing. So it really depends on the music director um, and, and how much they want to be involved in the process. I personally like when they're involved in it because, you know, I think it's, it's great to have uh, different opinions. You know, it, you, it can be very dangerous if you go with your own opinion all the time and you're in your own little bubble. Boy, really yeah, dangerous. I feel that way all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I'm glad I'm married. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Me too. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's awesome. That's that's really good insight. And I think that, uh, you know, learning how this organism sort of works uh, behind the scenes, I mean, there's just, there's so much that go in, that goes into just like, even one week, you, you know, you have to line up all these schedules and put them into the box. And then, you know, somebody wants to conduct or we'll get into programming now, but, uh, you know, somebody wants to conduct this, but you need them to conduct this because someone else wants yeah. to conduct that later, you know. So uh, let's, uh, I guess let's, uh, let's just go into the programming. Jump in. Like, like yeah. yeah. How do you decide programs? Yeah. 
So it, this in 2122, um, there is a specific thing driving me for that, which will launch in February. But I have one single theme that's spread over that season. Um, I have not approached it that way with Christoph before because Christoph has often kind of gone a different route and wanted to do a festival or whatnot. So, and, and also for uh, for for reference for people listening who aren't familiar, this is this season right now. Twenty twenty one is Christoph's final season with the orchestra. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so oh, yes. in twenty one twenty two, we we will uh, not have someone in place as music director. So just just for exactly. a, a bit of yeah. reference. Um, and yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Continue. You're, no, that's a good point. Actually, I'm I'm glad you said that because it is a good point. So in twenty one twenty two, I do have one single theme that's connecting every program throughout the season. So I'm not going to use that as the example, though, because I'm going to go to what I've typically been doing with Christoph each year. And what I try to do is try to have a nice balance of styles throughout the season. Once I've decided who the guest conductors are, um, I often have chosen them to come in as a guest conductor because they have a specialty. You know, if Nick McGeegan's coming in, to do a week with us. Nick McGeegan specializes in early classical in Baroque. I'm not going to ask Nick McGeegan to conduct a Strauss tone poem. You know, I'm mm -hmm. obviously going to try to get Nick to go more in the Haydn, Handel, early music direction. And then the same applies on the opposite spectrum. If I have a guest conductor that comes in and that is specializes in a certain thing, like for example, a couple of seasons ago, I had um, Marcus Stenz and he's Spe he specializes in Bruckner. So he conducted Bruckner's Fourth Symphony. I try to work with the guest conductors to give them what they're going to do best with. Because really that's, you know, that's what we want at the end of the day. We want mm -hmm. every conductor on the podium to have a good time. They don't always, unfortunately. <laughs> Sometimes the chemistry is just not there. Yeah. Um, but I try my best to help them. So... Most times there's a good balance and most times there's not too much of an argument. However, occasionally we do have to have quite a bit of back and forth because, you know, a guest conductor might turn to me and say, uh, I want to do Shostakovich Symphony Number no. 5. Well, I know that Christoph wants to do that next season. And actually that did happen to me, that specific piece. I knew that Christoph wanted to do Shostakovich Symphony No. 5 in his closing season. He had told me that already well in advance of this conversation. So I had to take Shostakovich 5 away from that guest conductor. And what I often do is I throw something back. So if they say, what about Shostakovich 5? I'll say, well, unfortunately that's not possible, but would you think of maybe seven or if you want to do Russian, maybe would you be interested in one of the Rachmaninoff symphonies, for example? And then if they're like, no, it's that's more on the romantic end. I want to stay in the Shostakovich side. And it's like, OK, well, maybe one of the others or maybe we do Prokofiev. Or sometimes they might say, oh, OK, if I can't do Shostakovich 5, then the other option is one of the Haydn London symphonies. So they will like, boom, yeah. start <laughs> way away. Yeah. And then I have to kind of change my mindset and say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Like, so, you know, I, I can do that. I, I could take a Haydn somewhere in there. I could take an early program. But I also then have to match it up with um, two other things, the soloist. So very often with the guest conductor, we will decide what, and I hate using this expression because I'm vegetarian, but it's the only expression that works. We'll decide the meat Mm -hmm. of the program first. Let's say the tofu, in my case, is Perfect. vegetarian. We'll decide the tofu. <laughs> yeah. So, but we'll decide we'll decide the meat, and that'll be a Mahler symphony, a Schubert symphony, whatever the case may be. Then we will match up with a guest artist. That's also a little bit of tennis between myself and the guest conductor. I have a number of people that I want to get in the same way I had my list of conductors, I have my list of artists, and I'll pitch a few people to them. They often, most times the guest conductor will trust me and they'll take who I think is the right fit for them. Or very often they'll say, oh yeah, I've worked with Jean-Yves Thibaudet before, that's brilliant, I'd love to have him again. Or the guest conductor will throw back an idea at me. And then I will 
see if I like that person or not. Mostly I do. But if I know that there's been some history with that artist and they haven't done so well, I try to dance around it as subtly and gently as possible. Once we have the artist decided, their concerto also weighs in to what the meat is going to be. So mm -hmm. we have a couple of options of the meat. Then we pick who the guest artist is going to be. Then I contact the guest artist, hope that they're available in that week, because that's a whole other jigsaw puzzle going on on the other side. The guest artist matches up, the guest conductor, and then I have to ask the guest artist what they're willing to play. So some guest artists are very flexible. They'll do just about anything. Some are not. And surprisingly, which I think would be surprisingly for people, is the more mature, seasoned, established artists they are actually the ones that offer less, hmm. which is interesting because their rep is probably much bigger than the younger ones, but they've, they've already done it. You know, they don't right. want to have to go through the sweat of learning a new concerto each and every single week. They don't need to. They've already made their names and they kind of come into a season. And they say, these are the three concertos I've got this season. Pick one. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to see, will it match with one of the meets? on that guest conductor's program. And then how does it match instrumentation wise? So this is the other bit. Uh -huh. You got to think of instrumentation. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you try your best to stay within the complement of what the orchestra has. And so our complement is three, 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 four, three, three, one. I think. Yes. Yeah. And for, so, the, for to decipher for the, this yeah. code, it, th three means like, However many, th that's the wind composition. Wind. So yeah. Three, yeah. three, three, three means triple oboe, clarinet, bassoon, flute, and then four horns, even though I think we have five horns and then yes, three. Yeah. And then, but you know, it's four horns because there's horns and then a, there's an assistant, an assistant and then yeah. three trumpets, three trombones, tuba, whatever mm -hmm. percussion. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Exactly. So. It. Yeah. So you try to stay in the complement because those are all the full-time musicians that we have and they're on the main orchestra's contract and they're, they're, they're signed up for each week. But of course, you know, there are certain works where they're fantastic and marketing love them, uh, but they are big, you know, and they require a lot of extras. Rite of Spring is an example. You know, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring requires an enormous array of extras but it packs the house because people love it. Um, interesting how people love it now when it created riots back in Paris <laughs> in the early 1900s. So remember that next time you listen to a contemporary piece that you don't like. Yeah. Maybe in 100 years time, it's probably going to be one of the favorites. You know, yeah. seriously. I mean, there were riots when the Rite of Spring was premiered. Yeah, in 100 in years, Stravinsky is going to start sounding like Haydn. To, to, um, yeah, yeah so. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so I always try to use that for contemporary music because then with the program, once we've, once we've established the artist, concerto, the meat, the big symphony, whatever the big work's going to be, if they match together appropriately, if um, the instrumentation is possible, and some programs you'll see do go outside the complement, but I try to keep a track of how many do because it's very expensive. You know, yeah. if you go outside the complement, you've got to hire in extras. And also for the orchestra, artistically, it can be a little unsettling as well because that's basically guests within the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And so you want to, they, they also need to feel like they've got their comfortable sound. And then we, of course, try to put in some contemporary music. And especially right now, more than ever, it's incredibly important that with programming, and you'll see that through my 2122, is really looking at minority composers and looking at the array of composers that have been around for years and years and years and just have not been on mine or many of my counterparts' radars. So we're really trying to organically and authentically incorporate that into programming now as well. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that music in particular is music that needs to be heard. Uh, just Definitely. And it's always needed to be heard. It's just now, yeah. for some reason, there was an impetus for it. Yeah. Um, but, man, what a, what a what an incredibly powerful vehicle for that. Um, yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, moving forward, like, 
you know, it's just, it's, it's necessary. And, and we're oh, not trying yes. to check any boxes where all we're, all we're trying to do is just play the music that that's authentically American yeah. and that we need to be yeah. playing. We need to be playing. Yeah. So it's so true. I mean, I, I have to say, uh, you know, I'm 37 years of age. I've been a pianist since the age of four. I've immersed myself in classical music and there are many composers that I did not know about that were living through Mozart's time, were studying with Nadia Boulanger, who she was this famous pedagogue in Paris, where Copeland studied with her and Bernstein was close with her. And she was a mentor to Stravinsky. And there were people that studied with her, like Florence Price and George Walker, that I never knew as a classical musician my entire life. So something's really wrong with that. And as you rightly said, Sam, it's just should just be natural now in our programming and there's an array of beautiful works. I mean, one example I will give you of that is we often play Barber's Adagio for Strings, which is actually a movement of his first string quartet. Mm -hmm. Now the Adagio for Strings has been reorchestrated, so orchestras play it a lot and it's possibly, dare I say, his most famous work. Mm -hmm. And one of the most recognizable works, you know, I think just about anyone is would recognize that, you know, in an elevator on the way up in a hotel somewhere, you know, it's really recognizable. Then you look at George Walker, who's an African-American composer who wrote a piece called Lyric for Strings, which is a stunning piece. Mm -hmm. Also being orchestrated that an or a string orchestra can play it, but it is also a movement of his first string quartet. And those two were roughly same time, you know, more or less around the same time. George Walker studied with Nadia Boulanger. So you're looking, I guess, am I right in saying around mid 1900s? I have like no that. idea. I am certainly no musicologist. So, well, <laughs> gosh, nor am I, nor am I. But why is that so? You know, you have to ask, why is that so? Why do we know? the iconic American composer, Samuel Barber's Adagio for String, and we don't know George Walker's lyric for strings. And he's an excellent, beautiful composer. And the whole string quartet is stunning as well. So it's it's been eye-opening, very important, um, but really enriching in the same breath as well. It's finally yeah. to realize that. Absolutely. So uh, also in terms of programming, like what are your thoughts on sort of non-traditional programs? So one of my favorite things is when I go to a program uh, and it's not just, you know, Overture, Overture concerto, concerto, Symphony. So like mm -hmm. this season, for example, one of the one of the concerts I was looking forward to the most that, of, of course, got canceled was the uh, the Beethoven potpourri, uh, where <laughs> yeah. it was like just a bunch of like, you know, we were celebrating, we were doing this whole Beethoven celebration and playing pretty much all of his, I mean, not all of his orchestral works, but most of them. Um, mm -hmm. And it was just like all these little like, overtures Minis. and like many yeah. things and and i thought that was just so cool uh and there's been a number of programs like that that you have been involved in creating that i mm. that i really like so like what what sort of like uh gets you going with those programs like how do you sort of mm. get the inspiration for stuff like that yeah that's yeah it's a great question i mean i think i also like them me 10 years ago i was a overture concerto symphony gal um i actually hated potpourri programs just 10, 15 years ago, I used to hate them. Now I have come to love them so much because, you know, we do live in a digital world and concentration span is not quite what it was, you know, so it is hard to expect the average listener to sit through 60 minutes. Now, I'm not saying that we won't do that sometimes, but it is hard for the average listener. So I find that with potpourri programs, like that, where you have a number of different pieces that are 15, 20 minutes long. It gives audience members bite-sized glimpses of different composers, different, different genres that hopefully are connected together telling one story. So in the Beethoven Potpourri program, for example, I'm trying to remember, I think we opened with Egmont, then our new sparkling, new, beautiful concertmaster, mm -hmm. Kevin Lynn, um, who were so fortunate to have him. He was going to play his second romance for violin and orchestra. Then I think uh, the beautiful soprano Felicia Moore was coming in to sing A Perfido, a 15-minute piece for soprano and orchestra. Then 
I think the reason I'm hesitating is I think our plan was actually to do some chamber music. I think we didn't have it set in stone. We were going to do some chamber music. We were going to try to do one of the string quartets uh -huh. and then close with his Leonorn uh, number three overture. And so it gave audience members, it would have given audience members a real nice picture, a collage of Beethoven's shorter works, of how he wrote a 10, 15 minute work, how he got a message across in 10, 15 minutes, um, which sometimes can be harder actually than getting the message across in 60 minutes. Right. Um, so usually I try to kind of have something that connects them, that they see a nice variety of composers or genres or tastes or styles, and that it's all connected together to get one single message across to the audience. It's fun, actually. It's yeah, fun. And harder to do with the conductors, though. Yes, yeah. Well, I think my, one of my favorite examples was the con the concert that Jacob Joyce conducted, who uh, we yeah. had on the podcast a few weeks ago. Uh, it yeah. was a Spanish or all Spanish-inspired program, and I think there were five pieces or something like that. Y yeah. And, and it yeah. just kind of went down. And I, I tell you, one of the reasons why I really like them is uh, audiences love applauding. They love it. They like can't get it's enough true. of applauding. And this gives them a non, like, it, people feel this irresponsibility clapping in the middle of movements, right? Or between yep. movements. And so yep. a potpourri program's like, great, the piece is over. Yeah. I can clap now and I don't have to be ashamed yeah. about clapping. <laughs> and yeah, I know. this like energy built, I remember specifically with that Spanish program, the energy was just like building throughout building. the programming because you were just mm -hmm. like, it was like one awesome piece after another. Mm -hmm. And they were just, mm -hmm. they, it was more involved, I thought. And I feel like, totally you know, was, symphonies yeah. are great and they, they need to be listened to, you know, front to back. But there's also like, you get to the middle of a symphony sometimes and it's like, okay, when are we going to get to the end? You know? know. <laughs> and so with the potpourri programs, it like, it gives you just a small condensed version of these symphonies mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it happens like five. I just think they're great. I, I think like yeah. energy wise, I love playing them. It's, it's, it's really fascinating to me. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, it begs the question and that's probably too long to get into of this podcast, but it does beg the question of, if the audience do feel a sense of relief that they can clap after 10, 15 minutes, how should we incorporate that yes. going forward into all programming? What, what, are we, what are we doing that makes them feel that they need to kind of release a little bit? And I think classical music programs have over time become quite sterile and stuffy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of audience members really want to express their joy for something, but they're intimidated too because they don't know the rules. And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that people should clap at the end of each movement. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in two minds about it, but I think we need to create a, an atmosphere that's more um, warm, relaxed, welcoming, so that if somebody does want to applaud, the world's not going to fall apart. Yeah. You know, it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, this, and I don't want to go on too much of a tangent because, like you said, we could probably have a whole other episode about just <laughs> this. But uh, there was a very famous concert that happened in Chicago roughly, probably eight, seven, eight years ago. And Michael Tilson Thomas was conducting Mahler's Ninth Symphony. And in between mm -hmm. the first and the second movement, he walked off stage. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And he came back on mm -hmm. stage and he had two handfuls of cough drops and he made some comments about you know i noticed people were coughing or whatever and he threw the cough drops into the audience right and they got like all this press i was actually at that concert wow and, really yes and the reason i tell this story is because it got all this negative press about how he was being such a jerk and like he didn't want people to cough it was completely the opposite it was like this very fun loving like you know, yeah. here's some cough drops, share them with your friends. Yeah. Like it was very yeah. like, and I tell you, after he did that, the entire feeling of the concert changed in like a, in a better way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Cause like mm -hmm. everyone was like more relaxed. They didn't have to worry about like, 
you know, he's not mad about people coughing. He's just making, mm-hmm. like, making a joke about it. And, like, I felt like the performance was actually more powerful once everyone just, like, chilled out a little bit. Chilled. You know? mm-hmm. like, so, so interesting. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to throw that out there because I know that, that that got a lot of coverage when it happened. And I mm-hmm. just had the complete opposite reaction opposite. being reaction. there. Um, yeah. And, but that speaks That's to your point so of like, it's so stuffy all the time and people are intimidated because they don't know when they can do this or, but I mean, as a performer, if someone wants to exclaim something or react, you know, maybe it, actually, can you perhaps tell the story about the Walton symphony about how, yeah. The, yeah okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, you, you, you read my mind yeah. there because that's a perfect example of it. Yeah. So, um, when was that, Sam? 1890. And it was our first time having the Canadian conductor, uh, Peter Ungen. And uh, we programmed in the first half, we did Sibelius Violin Concerto with James Ennis. And in the second half, Walton Symphony Number no. 1, which had never been played by the Indianapolis Symphony, which to briefly dart back to programming, that's another thing that I tried to do. I tried to have at least one work that the orchestra's never done before. Not contemporary. Something that's been in the files for right. many, many years that the ISO has never done. Because I think that's, you know, that's how you keep musicians interested, challenged, keep the chops up, all that. So Walton Symphony Number no. 1 was that symphony. And um, the audience, of course, many of the audience had never heard it before either. And so we were sitting there and I was actually, I have to say, I was quite nervous, but it's an amazing symphony. And I knew in my heart, it's an amazing symphony. They're going to love it, but you're still nervous. You don't know how the audience is going to react. The first movement is bombastic and the ISO killed it. I mean, they just played fabulously throughout that symphony. And they were also really on top of it because it was new to them. So they really, everyone had practiced their parts and they were anxious, but they were enjoying the week with Peter for the most part, I hope. No, I I really liked him. Yeah. yeah, And then, you know, it had the first movement ended and you could feel the energy in the hall from the audience that they had just heard something for the first time that was so cool, so much so that a member in the audience shouted out at the end of the first movement, shouted, awesome. (laughs) And the whole audience just erupted and started clapping at the end of the first movement. And it was just the most amazing feeling that I'll never forget for the rest of my life because it made us all realize, yeah, they love this. This is a great symphony and they're hearing it for the first time. And if they had seen Walton Symphony Number no. 1 on a flyer for the concert, they probably would have said, oh, I don't know that piece, so I'm not going to go. But look at the reaction that they had. You know, Hopefully we gained a few audience members that trust us a little bit with programming. Like if we program it, trust us. We're doing it for a reason. Yeah, and that's so cool. And, and, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the, uh, just the authentic reaction. You know, If you feel like applauding, applaud. I mean, don't do it like, well, I shouldn't say I'm. I should say don't do it. But like you know, yeah, yeah. people are playing and 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 it's inappropriate time to do so. But yeah. if it's after yeah. a movement is over and you just yeah, just do it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just do it. Yeah, like it, it creates moments like the ones we're sharing. And I think that mm-hmm. that's you know that that's the stuff that I remember. To be honest, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I don't remember a, a run through of Beethoven's Eroica on a random Saturday night sometime in March. Like, I I have no mm-hmm. idea what happened at that concert. Mm-hmm. But when stuff like somebody shouts awesome, or like I yeah. remember the first time uh, I, I went to, uh, I saw the John Adams Harmony Layer performed. And at, oh. at the very end, there was an audience member that gasped. Like, yeah. And I, I remembered that, you know, like, so those are the things that like I remember. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's okay when you come to concerts to like have those yeah. reactions. I think it's totally okay. Yeah, it'll take time. It, yep. That's the same way we've had to train the audience into not clapping we're going to have to retrain them into feeling comfortable because we almost tried to do that at one point where we said like, just clap whenever you feel like it. But then it was an unnatural clap at the end of each movement. Right. So that had a bad effect actually. It was unsettling because it was like, oh gosh, then they felt like they had to clap and it was awkward. But we need to train audience members into just feeling like if you feel you want to clap, if you feel you want to congratulate, then just do it. They do it in the opera all the time. Right, right. (laughs) <laughs> and um, they used to in the past they used to applaud so much that sometimes in the time of Beethoven Mozart they had to repeat a movement 
the audience would applaud so much at the end of a movement. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I hope not during Beethoven 9, because I don't know if I could make it through the end of the piece if we had to repeat <laughs> yeah, one of those movements. But, yeah, um, <laughs> all right, so we've kind of veered a little bit, but, but yeah, that's, sorry. I, I'll take uh, credit for that. Uh, but <laughs> yes. uh, so let's, let's go back to the, uh, the ISO specifically. So obviously you've alluded to this, but we're in the process of a music director search. So mm. um, what all is involved with that? I know you sort of preface this by saying, well, you know, we're, we're always in a music director search. And I think that that's very true, but in terms of like, kind of like how you sort of get from point A to point B to point C, you know, all the way leading towards a music director appointment, like, uh, you know, can you sort of describe like those processes and sort of where, you know, we are, well, I don't know if you can share this, but sort of like, sort of where we we're kind of hovering at this point in time. Of course. Yeah, of course. Well, so, you know, Christopher Bansky announced um, in May of 2019, am I right in that? Yes, in May of 2019, he announced that he sadly was finishing his tenure as music director with us and that the 2021 season would be his 10th season with us. And um, immediately after that, we formed a search committee. And that was sort of the main first step. Uh, the members of the search committee, there's a variety. There's um, members of the board are on the search committee. There are members of the musicians and myself and our CEO. So there are 10 of us all together. And we met first in um, July of 2019 because it took a couple of months to get that committee together. You know, you have to actually have the orchestra as a whole voting on who they want the musicians to be and the same for the board and whatnot. Uh, So we got together first in July 2019. And actually what we did at that first meeting, um, which was at the recommendation of our CEO, um, and it was a great recommendation, is he said, let's just spend the time going through what we want to see in the next music director. Mm -hmm. And he pulled out flip charts and he just took down notes of everything that everyone on the committee said. And from then, I created an internal music director job description. Now, with a music director, it doesn't get, well, certainly a music director of of a position like the ISO Symphony doesn't get posted on recruitment pages. You know, you you don't don't see it on Reddit or uh, no. uh, What's what's that? (laughs) uh, Craigslist. (laughs) Craigslist. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, you don't see it on any of those. It's not. It's not a HR type position like that. But we created the internal music director job description for two reasons. One is we wanted to have something that we could keep as a really solid guideline and a tool for the music director search committee to turn to, and we still do turn to it to this day. And then also something that I could share with managers, because in a music director search, the minute Christoph had announced, the minute it was made public, I was flooded with emails. I mean, I literally flooded with yeah, emails. That's not shocking. From managers, yeah, from managers I'd never even heard of, suggesting conductors that had never been with the ISO. And telling me that that conductor is definitely the best conductor and perfect for the ISO, which I just thought, oh, okay, I'm sure that's a great conductor, but how do you know they're perfect for the ISO? Like, you don't know me, you've never been, I mean, it's crazy. So it was an overwhelming flood. And, and it was some, mostly the managers that I work with are highly skilled. So it yeah. wasn't from those ones, you yeah. know, it wasn't from, it wasn't from the top managers in the, in, in the industry. But when we created that internal job description, I was able to share it with those top managers. I was able to share it with the managers that I have a relationship with and I know, and it helped them to then go back and look at their roster and say, okay, what does the ISO need? Who fits? And it just, it was a way not to waste time. And Mm -hmm. it worked perfectly because then they were able to suggest some people to me that actually were great suggestions. And after that, we created a survey We wanted to have everybody's input. So we sent a survey link out to all the staff, to all the board and all the musicians. The only difference, and in the survey was asking various qualities, ranking qualities, you know, how important is it that the music director is engaged with the community, rank from one to five. Questions like that. How important Mm -hmm. is it for them to have good technique? And we've had different sections, musicality, their experience, their personality, that kind of stuff. 
And the difference that the musicians had was they were able to suggest up to five conductors that we could consider. Some people didn't suggest any, some suggested filled all five slots. Through that, we gathered approximately 65 names altogether. And I added another 20, 25 on top of it that I just know from the industry and had been getting suggestions about. And also some members of the committee also added in some names. So we got up to about 90 with all of that. And we spent from, uh, we had a meeting December 12th, 2019, through to when we met again, I think it was February 6th, 2020. We spent that time reviewing all 90 names. I sent a big chart with links to their bios and where their music director of or chief conductor of if they're in Europe or whatever the case may be. And then we got together, um, as I say, on February 6th, I think it was, and we spent the next few meetings putting each of those names into three lists. List A being names that if we needed to, we could turn to today and say, would you like to be our music director? People that we know, people we know that are interested in the job and we feel good about. List B was people that we might know, but not know very well. People we've heard of, but don't know at all. Interesting people. And list C, people that are just not right, the right fit for us. Either they're, you know, just not going to be interested in coming to be a music director for the Indianapolis Symphony because maybe they're at a point in their career where they're retiring or they're too young for us, you know, that they're not quite at the level for the ISO just yet. Is it also people who might have just gotten another job? Would they be in that yes. list as well? Okay. Exactly, exactly. Um, you and I have a name that we talked about that made it into that list, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because he was just announced with another job right when we started our search. Um, so list C, fortunately, is the biggest list. Thank God, it's the biggest list because <laughs> it's the one that we don't really look at. Yeah. Then <laughs> through list A and B, we slowly dwindled down. And we got it down to about 12 to 15 names. And I say 12 to 15 because, you know, people kind of come in and out, in and out of that narrowed down list. And now we're down to focusing on six of those 15 names. And that doesn't mean that we've forgotten the others in the list of 15, but we've just decided let's focus on six of these for now. And we actually just recently had a meeting where we all threw out who our top three names are. Nothing set in stone. Nobody's making anyone sign any dotted lines. We're not making any offers. It's just where you are at a year and a couple of months into the search. Where are, Where's your gut right now with who we're looking for? And so we've got six names right now. And what we're doing over this season, which is challenging because all the orchestras have canceled their main series. And um, orchestras that are still playing, which there are, you know, many orchestras that are playing, but only in their hall with no audience. So nobody can come in to see it. And mostly only with their music director, not with guest conductors. Yeah, or, or so, staff conductors. Or staff conductors, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's become really challenging. And then further to that, conductors that are based in Europe or outside the U.S. can't get into the U.S. right now because right. of complications and visas and all that stuff. So it's going to be challenging this year to try to see people. But fortunately, we've got things like Zoom, so we can try to get to know them a little over Zoom. Some of them are doing some socially distanced stuff that we might be able to go and be a fly on the wall. Um, so we're going to try to see some of those names as much as we can and then hopefully try to get some of them into our hall um, with our orchestra so that we can see what the chemistry is like. So that's where we are in the search process. Um, when will we know? We are not in a rush. You know, we want to make sure that we make the right decision. So um, it may take another season or so for us to get there. Let's see. It's all about chemistry and it's all about, you know, they have to love us as much as we love them. Right. So we've got to let time pass for that. And the Music Director Search Committee, you know, we feel we feel pretty comfortable right now, actually. I think everyone's feeling pretty good. Um, we've got a good number of people that we're looking at. So let's see. Yeah.
that's a that's quite an intensive process, along with planning a season. Uh, one other question: Do you sleep at all, or like what's? <laughs> Yeah, I totally do. Actually, I love sleep. Okay, I 100 well, percent do. I don't, I'm, I'm I don't know how you have time that... for it, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so one, no, no. Uh, but in all serious, seriousness, one, a couple final questions. So, what would you say is the most time-consuming part of your job? Yeah, that's a great, great. I keep saying that's a great question, but they really are. They're all great questions. Oh, I feel like a politician. That seems to be the answer <laughs> that the politicians give. Um, the most time-consuming part of my job but it's the most enjoyable part of my job is um, when the artist is in town, mm -hmm. actually, because when the artist, and I mean both soloist and conductor, when they're in town with the ISO, it's very important for me that they feel welcomed and comfortable. And in a week where it's a classical week with the artist here, I sort of drop everything because they are my priority. Whenever they're on stage, I want to be in the hall listening. First, to show support for them, but also I kind of want to see what they're like. You know, I want to decide. Mm -hmm. And I judge that based on how the musicians are reacting and how they're playing as well. But I want to be around, I want to be there on the breaks. I want to be able to be there to chat with them during a lunch break, an hour in between rehearsals. I want to take them out for dinner. If they, you know, I've had situations where the artist has said, gosh, I can't sleep because the material of my pillowcase is really weird. And I run out and I get them a new pillowcase to try to help them sleep because it's, you know, or, or, or my manager of artistic does or somebody else does. And, you know, we're all there trying to help as much as possible because the most important thing for the artist is that they need to feel comfortable and they need to feel welcomed. We are their family for the week. Yep. You know, these artists are going from one city to the next, from one hotel room to another hotel room. It's it's actually a miserable life, honestly. <laughs> yeah. So if we can make them feel like family, if we can make them feel like that they can chat to us about just about anything, that's the most important thing. So it's most time consuming, but it's my favorite part of the job because you meet such brilliant personalities. You really do. And you make great friends. Well, good. Well, you, you answered both of my final questions in the same question, so okay. I appreciate it. Uh, so, Katie, this has been really fantastic, and I always give my guests an opportunity for any last words, shout-outs, pieces of advice, or words of wisdom. Oh, my gosh. Words of wisdom. Um, what I tell everyone out there is stay connected. We're not able to hear music live right now, but there is so much music online Stay connected with everyone online, listen to podcasts, check out YouTube links, just make sure that you stay connected because the music will come back. Our ISO will be back and are dying to come back as soon as possible. And we just want to keep you fed until that time. So stay connected online, keep watching things like Sam's podcast, keep checking out Spotify's, make your list of pieces that you want to hear with the ISO. And then when we finally are able to come back again, I promise you, we're going to be welcoming you with a giant, warm, cozy hug. Yeah. Well, I know, speaking for myself, I cannot wait for that day to come because uh, I have missed you dearly and missed our artists Likewise. and missed my colleagues and missed the audience and, uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a pretty special moment when that all comes together. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess one thing, I, you know, I, I'm sort of backtracking a little bit, but I, I <laughs> forgot to uh, ask you about your sort of background because, oh, you know, I, I yeah. know it's you're, you You obviously speak very intelligently of uh, uh, music and, and your knowledge of that. Uh, but I, I think that it's important to know sort of like how you got into uh yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm doing this a little backwards because I already gave you no, your okay. words of wisdom and advice, <laughs> but I, I think it's important for people to know uh, your background. So do you just want to briefly, yeah. you know, just chat about like sort of how you got to where you are? Yeah, of course. Well, a quick summary and going from where I am all the way back is, you know, I started as the director of artistic planning for um, the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra in January 2017. Prior to that, um, I worked as the right-hand man, right-hand woman um, in the artistic department of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra for three years. Um, prior to that, I worked as an assistant artist manager at Harrison Parrott in London, which is a really reputable artist management company um, there based in London. But 
that was my first entry into the management world back in 2011. So I've actually only been in management for about 10 years now. You know, mm-hmm. prior to Harrison Fire, I worked for the Aspen Music Festival for a couple of summers. I worked for festivals throughout Ireland, Dublin, which is where I'm from. But I was actually pursuing my doctorate in piano performance. When halfway through it, I decided to take a sabbatical year. I've never gone back. And I took a sabbatical year to work for Harrison Parrot in London because I sort of thought I want to try it out. And I wasn't quite sure because I had been a pianist since the age of four. I was born in Cork in the south of Ireland, um, moved to Dublin. My whole family is in Dublin, except for one sister who lives in Zurich. She's a violinist, actually. And I spent my whole life as a classical pianist. Um, I did my bachelor's in piano performance in Dublin um, at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, which is a conservatory there with the Irish pianist John O'Connor. Then I got a Fulbright scholarship to go and study at Indiana University Jacobs School of Music in Bloomington, Mm -hmm. believe it or not. It's weird how life comes around. Um, And I did my master's there for two years. I stayed on as a performance diploma student. Um, And that's when I started to realize that management even existed. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it existed, which is something now I'm sort of making a bit of a mission of mine when I speak to full-time performance majors. I try to tell them that if you find that you're not going to play in an orchestra or be a concert artist, it doesn't mean that you have to let go of music. Mm -hmm. There are other paths like mine. And so in the third year there as a performance diploma student, I started taking some credits in the arts admin um, course at IU and I was dreadful at it. I had no clue what I was doing. The Fulbright, well, sorry, fortunately means that you have to go home. The idea with a Fulbright scholarship is you give back to your home country. So I had to go back home to Ireland and I went back home to do a doctorate in piano performance. But as I say, about three years into it, Mm -hmm. um, I decided to take the sabbatical to try out Harrison Paris in London and never looked back. And I love it. To this day, I made the best decision of my life and I'm able to use my foundation and my skills as a musician. And they really stand to me today. But I feel like I'm able to make a bigger impact on the industry in the management side because I know what it means to be a musician. I know many how many hours of practice a musician and artist has to put into getting to where they are today. And I think that understanding helps me immensely in my job. And I just hope that I can make an impact in the industry in a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's important for uh, our listeners to know is like, you know, you have plenty of people like Katie who, you know, you still love music, you're still around it and you, you contribute uh, significantly to it, and, mm. but you're not playing on stage, which is totally great because yeah. we need, yeah. we need people like you just as much as, you, as we need people like me. So definitely, um, yeah. definitely very good advice. And uh, yeah, so thanks for, thanks for giving that background. And uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight, Katie. It's, been, it's a uh, pleasure, Sam. Yeah, it's been really great. And uh, I, I, like I said, I can't wait to see you back at work. Uh, hopefully, knock on wood, yeah. hopefully yeah, sooner hopefully rather than soon. later. Yeah, Sam, you're <laughs> great. This podcast is fantastic. And I really miss you and all of the musicians of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. The best best bunch ever so really missing you all and can't wait to get back to normal oh thanks so much and uh for our new listeners out there please make sure to like us on facebook follow us on instagram at the candid clarinetist subscribe to our youtube channel and follow us on twitch at twitch.tv slash the candid clarinetist you can also find links to all of these things as well as information about myself and the podcast at candid clarinetistpodcast.com once again i am sam rothstein and thanks for tuning into the candid clarinetist podcast <laughs>